Welcome to National Parks Traveler, where we explore the national parks and the issues that involve them. It is largely known that before Dry Tortugas became a national park, that it was home to a massive Civil War era fort. Fort Jefferson, the largest all masonry fort built in the United States, was constructed between 1846 and 1875 to protect the nation's gateway to the Gulf of Mexico. Today, you can walk some of the corridors of this magnificent structure and learn about the prisoners who were housed there during the Civil War and the military staff and their families who lived there as well. This is Kurt Repencheck, your host at the National Parks Traveler. What you can't see during a visit to Dry Tortugas National Park, however, are the remains of a hospital and a graveyard. But more clues are being uncovered about life and death during the 19th century military era at Fort Jefferson. Once a thriving community of Army soldiers, civilians, laborers, and slaves, the imposing brick-constructed Fort Jefferson is now the heart of the National Park and virtually the only above-water relic of that era there. But recently, hard evidence of long-lost hospitals and cemeteries has been discovered not far offshore. The Traveler's Lynn Riddick explores this past with the park's maritime archaeologist, Joshua Marano. What were places of convalescence and final rest for many Fort Jefferson inhabitants, many whom perished from yellow fever, were claimed by the ocean decades ago? Yet new evidence, including the discovery of a second time-worn headstone, are adding more intriguing pieces to the puzzle. Lynn will be back with Joshua in a minute. Washington State is graced with three spectacular national parks, each different and special in their own unique ways. As the official nonprofit partner and the only philanthropic organization dedicated exclusively to supporting these parks through charitable contributions, Washington's National Park Fund has a mission to raise private support to deepen everyone's love for, understanding of, and experiences in Mount Rainier, North Cascades, and Olympic National Parks. Share your passion for these parks at WNPF.org. Acadia National Park is one of the 10 most popular national parks in the United States. It is also one of the smallest and most vulnerable. That's why Friends of Acadia exists. Friends of Acadia is an independent organization of passionate people, inspiring those who love this magnificent park to make a real and lasting difference for Acadia. You can make a difference too at friendsofacadia.org. Whether it be strategy, business planning, change management, board development, executive search, or diversity planning, Potrero Group is here to help. They mix a depth of experience in the parks and land space with the breadth of best practices from other industries. For more information or to schedule a preliminary conversation, go to potrerogroup.com. P-O-T-R-E-R-O group.com. The Everglades Foundation the only organization whose sole mission is to restore and protect America's Everglades. Learn more at evergladesfoundation.org. It's not every day an old hospital and cemetery are found nearly 10 feet under the ocean, but that's what happened at Dry Tortugas National Park. Park maritime archeologist, Josh Morano is calling in from his office in Homestead, Florida, to tell us all about it. Hi, Josh, welcome to The Traveler. Hello, and thank you guys for having me. Well, I wanna start by having you describe the National Park. How big is it? How many islands are part of it? What's there? So, um, first of all, I'm, I'm a member of the South Florida uh, National Parks Cultural Resource Division. And so more recently in the last few years, uh, the cultural resource divisions of each of the individual South Florida parks. So this is Everglades, Biscayne, and Dry Tortugas National Parks have kind of combined. And each park kind of has their own dedicated archaeologist. Uh, for Dry Tortugas and Biscayne, given the maritime nature of those parks, uh, I'm pretty much the, the go-to uh, for those two. Um, so within that, uh, Dry Tortugas National Park was established back in the 1930s principally to protect not only the remains of Fort Jefferson, which was a large uh, masonry fort uh, that's located in the park, but also the natural resources that are surrounding it. And the dry tortugas were discovered by Ponce de Leon? 
Correct. All the way back in the early 1500s. And it's it's had a pretty interesting but poorly documented history over the next, like, say, 300 years. And it really wasn't until the 19th century that uh, the dry tortugas really became established, uh, at least within the United States, as a major military installation and, and an important area for, for both international commerce as well as military strength and power in that area. And did you mention how big the park is, how many islands are part of it? Yes, and I'm, I'm actually going to be a little bit of a bad park ranger right now and because I don't typically work down there. I believe it's approximately 100 square miles. I'm not sure exactly how many acres that is right offhand, um, but it's located about 70 miles west of Key West, and it's one of the more remote parks in the system. And uh, there were historically, back when Ponte de Leon located uh, the islands back in the early 1500s, up to 11 islands within what is now the park. That has since changed, and there was really only seven left. Uh, there are a lot of dynamic forces that I'm sure we'll be talking about a little later in the blog uh, in terms of why the islands kind of move around and disappear and reappear over time. Uh, but right now, there's only seven, and really two of those have combined here in the last few years. So, Interesting. Well, given that the area was a busy shipping route, um, there's abundance of underwater resources to explore there, correct? I was curious to know what kind of ship traffic passed through there. So pretty much anything that was coming through the Caribbean pretty much passed by the dry tortugas. And so there is a, a large variety of uh, maritime cultural heritage that spans probably from the, I think, the earliest known wrecking events that we have are in the 15 and 1600s. Uh, but in terms of identified sites, some of the earliest that we have are from the Spanish in the 1620s. And then we actually have a British warship uh, that wrecked in 1742. Beyond that, a large amount of shipping traffic was directly associated with the construction of the fort. And so there's a large number of 19th century wrecks kind of surrounding the uh, the fort itself as, it was manu- as the vessels were maneuvering trying to get into Fort Jefferson. Yeah, I want to talk more about the fort. Um, so when you look at a picture of it, the structure is really remarkable because it takes up virtually the entire island, the garden key, they call it. it. It just seems huge. So tell us a bit about the purpose of the fort and how long it was in use. So when the area was annexed uh, or, or taken in as a United States territory in the uh, after 1819, it was pretty quickly realized that it had considerable military importance. In eight, the 1840s, their decision was made to establish a fortification on this on the one of the islands within the, uh, the park, and Garden Key was selected for that purpose. And they built or started to build a very large uh, masonry fortification in that location that pretty much took up the entire island. And it was under construction continuously from the 1840s all the way up until 1874, when the fortification was essentially abandoned by the army. And it was abandoned for a number of reasons. Essentially, during the Civil War, the invention of rifled cannon and exploding shell really made masonry forts obsolete. So it it pretty much became obsolete as a military installation before it was even completed. But what it was utilized for, given its isolation and and, uh, how far off into the, uh, the Gulf it was, it was actually utilized as a military prison for the vast majority of the American Civil War and shortly thereafter. Um, and that's really where its uh, notoriety comes into play. Now, after the Army uh, abandoned its use in the 1870s, it was later used by the U.S. Uh, Marine Hospital Service as a quarantine station and then by the U.S. Navy as a coaling uh, location where they would resupply military ships uh, in the 1890s all the way through the early 1900s. Do you think that some of the prisoners of war there were just maybe forgotten, left there? Honestly, I think that is a challenge. They weren't left there by the army, but in terms of their stories, I do think that that we have we have an opportunity to tell a lot of those stories that maybe not hasn't necessarily been highlighted as of yet. Really, in terms of interpretation of the fort now, we really tend to focus on, or at least previously, we focused on the construction of the fort as the largest masonry structure in the Western Hemisphere and the lives of maybe a few notable uh, prisoners, namely Samuel Mudd, who was one of the, the Lincoln conspirators, who was actually the doctor that reset John Wilkes Booth's leg um, after the assassination. And he was one of the prisoners out there and, and made some contributions to uh, the health and well-being of the other prisoners out there during some of the yellow fever epidemics. But beyond that, we've really, we haven't 
yet really delve into some of the stories of those prisoners, the military units that were assigned out there, what the soldiers did before they came to Fort Jefferson, what they did after they came to Fort Jefferson, and even some of the civilian populations that stayed out there. Um, there were a lot of people beyond just prisoners and soldiers stationed at the fort. It was really its own tiny town at the time. There were women and children, there were enslaved people, and we haven't yet done a good job at really starting to, to highlight some of those stories. And I think that this find may kind of start that conversation. Well, let's talk more about the find. So um, how were the hospitals and the graves discovered? Honestly, it, it was a little bit of, of dumb luck and archaeological guesswork. Uh, I was flying over the Dry Tortugas in about 2016, and I happened to look down on, uh, we were doing the seaplane, so we were kind of coming in and approaching for a landing, and being the archaeologist that I was, of course, I was looking out the window like everyone else is on the seaplane, and I happened to see a pattern in the water. And I was always taught as an archaeologist that if you see a pattern in nature, it can tell you potentially a little bit about that area, and it's not always natural. Um, so I went and did some background research once I returned, because at that time I wasn't really officially attached to the park. I was visiting to help with another project, um, but I was interested. And so we we came back and dug into the archives, essentially, and we figured out that there was structures on, on this particular island and that it did have a history that was a little bit separate from the fort. And that there have been a number of structures on this particular island built from the 1860s all the way up into the late 1900s. So that led us to believe, I said, okay, well, there's something in the water at this location. But it wasn't until 2022, until we were really able to get out and, and get our heads in the water and actually get in the field. And so when we conducted our survey, uh, we, we kind of knew the area that we wanted to look in, and we expected to find something along the lines of foundations uh, to a building potentially, but we did not expect to find what we found. Prior to your 2016 sighting, had anyone in recent times been aware that those uh, cemeteries and hospitals were there? Not really. There was a reference in the 1990s during an aerial survey of, of something in the water, but they never went and investigated it. And then historically speaking, we have historical documentation of a lot of these resources being identified. But the problem is, is that it's such a dynamic environment in the Dry Tortugas, it was kind of assumed that they were all just washed away and forgotten. And uh, that's a problem that I've seen in a lot of maritime archaeological context here in South Florida is if from a management perspective and from a thought perspective is if it's underwater, it just kind of disappears. And that's not necessarily the case. And that's something that we've really been able to capitalize on is that even though it's just a few feet below the surface, there's still a lot of history to be told. Absolutely. So where exactly are the hospital and the cemetery that, that we're talking about, uh, I guess, from the shoreline? Um, curious to know how deep the water is exactly uh, where they're found. So uh, oddly enough, there were hospitals and ancillary structures located on almost every single island in the Dry Tortugas. There was a so limited amount of space that they pretty much had to utilize every island. And so from an archaeological standpoint, we do our we don't really broadcast the exact location of our archaeological resources, particularly in a place like the Dry Tortugas, where obviously enforcement is difficult. We don't have a lot of folks. You're kind of so far away. Uh, we don't really have effective means of patrolling these areas. It's not like in Yosemite or Grand Canyon where you have a gate that you can close off, or maybe you can put up a trail camera to to ensure that sites are you know no nobody's doing what they shouldn't suppose or shouldn't be doing. So because of that, we don't typically broadcast our locations of, of all of our sites, and particularly sensitive ones like this, uh, where there could be potential for human remains. So what we're saying is that the site itself is located in less than 10 feet of water, and it's pretty close to the fortification. Interesting. Yeah, I was going to ask if um, any recreational diving was allowed uh, in that area to explore, but you answered my question. <laughs> Well, it, so it is. You, you're allowed to go visit these sites, uh, but we're just not necessarily going to put out where every site is located. I see. And we actually want people to go out and visit their national parks and enjoy the resources that we have out here. Um, it's just that we we don't typically publish archaeological site location information. So it's curious to me um, that the cemetery and the hospital that you uncovered are so deep underwater. So any idea how they got covered up by water or I'm thinking maybe the hospital toppled over in a storm and eventually it just all sort of, you know, got buried by shifting sands. 
you know, any timeline showing any kind of slow disappearance? Um, yes and no. So it's the exact mechanics of why this is several feet underwater now. It, it, we're still trying to figure that out. But historically speaking, the islands uh, within the dry tortugas are very dynamic. They're not like, the, let's say, the islands that are within Biscayne that are, we refer to them as keys. They're actually islands that are established basically on top of fossilized coral reef. Because they're rock, they don't tend to shift or move around too much. The keys in the dry tortugas are different. They're, they're sand-based. They're basically sandbars on top of old coral reefs. So they are constantly moving around. Uh, some of the islands have historically disappeared and reappeared. And so in this case, we do know that uh, the particular island was evident in some of the earliest maps, and it disappeared about 100 years ago. And there are actually historical accounts of kind of alluding to why it disappeared. Uh, the big event was a major hurricane in the 1930s. Uh, basically, after that, the island submerged and really didn't reappear. It may have come up once or twice, but not long enough to be mapped. Historically, we're finding more and more information about the ecological environment that was on this island at the time and how major storm events and uh, increasing tidal oscillation in that area would actually come up and kill a lot of the vegetation. Once the vegetation died off, the sand was much more mobile, and that tended to have it kind of shift and move around. And so that seemed to be a, a correlating series of events between major increasing number of major storm events kind of killing off all the vegetation and then the island kind of sh slowly eroding away. So it wasn't necessarily a dramatic where you have a big undercut and the island's gone all of a sudden, but it was kind of a slow process that eventually when it did go, uh, it didn't reappear. And yet it seems that um, Garden Key is stable with the fort sitting on top of it, or has that shifted much over the years? It, it has shifted as much as it can. Uh, the fort is pretty much a stabilizing structure in terms of it has established a seawall or around it, if you will. But even within that, there are issues with erosion and undercutting. There's several projects right now to repair the counter scarp that was heavily damaged during Hurricane Ian, I'm sorry, Irma in 2017, and then further damaged in Hurricane Ian uh, just a few years ago, uh, where the sand has actually undercut underneath the uh, the counter scarp and has pulled away, leaving voids, which has caused cracks and other structural um, degradation of that that particular resource. Um, but even if you look at historical aerials of Garden Key, there used to be a inlet, essentially, that you could drive a large ship all the way around Garden Key, and that closed up, I think, in 2009 and hasn't, hasn't reopened. Uh, now there is a large birding area just right beside the, the island that isn't going anywhere anytime soon. So these islands are constantly in a state of flux with the uh, with Garden Key, I would say that the, the masonry structure itself is really the only reason the island is probably still there in its current formation. This is Lynn Riddick talking with maritime archaeologist Josh Morano, and we'll be back after this short break. Listener and reader support make National Parks Traveler possible every day of the year. If you enjoy the Traveler's content, please consider a donation via nationalparkstraveler.org. The Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation is the primary nonprofit fundraising partner for the Blue Ridge Parkway. It is made up of people who have a deep love for this majestic road and want to ensure that its natural beauty and the experiences it offers endure for generations to come. You can show your appreciation at brpfoundation.org. Do you work or volunteer for the National Park Service? Are you retired from the Department of the Interior? Learn how you could earn $250 by joining Interior Federal Credit Union and opening up a new credit card. Visit their website for membership details and how to join. Federally insured by NCUA. The Yosemite Conservancy helps visitors connect with Yosemite through adventures, volunteering, and the arts. It's the only nonprofit dedicated to supporting Yosemite National Park and funds grants to improve trails, restore habitat, protect wildlife, and inspire the next generation of nature lovers. Learn more at yosemite.org. The Grand Teton National Park Foundation is a private, nonprofit organization that supports projects that protect and enhance Grand Teton National Park's cultural, historic, and natural resources. By funding initiatives that go beyond what the National Park Service could accomplish on its own, Foundation donors improve the visitor experience and provide benefits to the national park system for decades to come. See their successes at gtnpf.org. 
Full of stunning photography and thought-provoking reads, Smokey's Life is a biannual magazine produced by Great Smoky Mountains Association. Members receive it free of charge each spring and fall, and it is available for purchase in retail stores throughout Great Smoky Mountains National Park and online at smokiesinformation.org. I'm back now with Josh Morano of Dry Tortugas National Park. Tell me more about the history of the hospital and the cemetery. Fort Jefferson was a city in and of itself. At its height, there were probably more than 2,000 people living on the 32-acre island. So you, you think of a very small, densely populated area. Disease was a major concern for, uh, for the folks living out there, and particularly yellow fever, which was very transmittable. They didn't necessarily understand why it transmitted as easily as it did. Uh, of course, now we know it was transmitted via mosquitoes. Um, but they didn't understand exactly how at the time. And there was a lot of concern over particularly dead bodies, you know, what to do with them. And, and there was a push to basically remove folks who had expired uh, from any disease, uh, particularly if it was unidentified or if it was known as a case of yellow fever, uh, as quickly as possible. And so there was an effort to establish burial grounds exterior to the fort on some of these ancillary islands nearby that they could quickly get and perform a, a burial and internment pretty much as quickly as they could. With that, like I said, almost all of the islands surrounding Garden Key were utilized at some point for internments, uh, as well as hospitals, because they didn't necessarily want to treat uh, sick patients within the fort as well, for fear that they would spread any sickness that they had around other folks, because it was so densely populated. Um, so there were islands that were specifically set aside, both as quarantine hospitals, as well as burial grounds. And so that's really where the history, at least initially, uh, for this island got started. The hospital foundations that we located are not the Civil War era hospital. That's actually the ones that we located are from the 1890s when it was reestablished through the U.S. Marine Hospital Service. And so that's the uh, later 1890s hospital that we had actually located. Now, the burials that are surrounding this hospital were there. That island was basically utilized as a burial ground from about the 1860, about 1860 to all the way up until I think the latest date that we have is 1893 uh, from historical documentation. And that basically anyone that passed at the fort were interred in one of these locations. And we have historical documentation. We have lists of, of who was buried at this particular island. And right now, our current running list, we have about between 30 and 50 people interred at this location. The vast majority of them are U.S. soldiers. Interesting. And then, of course, there were some civilians, enslaved men and women were, they were part of the population of Fort Jefferson. Any indication or records to show that they might also be buried there or in some of the other yes. locations? Yes. Yeah, so we don't have too many records on enslaved uh, individuals yet. Um, but interestingly enough, the, the, the one gravestone that we have found, um, and I say that kind of jokingly because we actually just found another one last week and you're probably the first to know about it um Hooray. <laughs> the first gravestone that we located was very interesting you know we, we found the foundations and we were doing a a systematic snorkeling survey basically swimming lines over this uh, sandbar and we had uh, one of our interns Devin Fogarty who was uh, with the University of Miami located something that she thought was a separate foundation or a large piece of concrete and so we she had me come over to to it and look and uh, it actually, I looked at it and I immediately knew it wasn't a uh, foundation and thought it was a headstone. It was five and a half, six feet long, two foot wide, flat stone. And when we swam up to it, it was the exact same stone that if you walk into Fort Jefferson, the first tier, that's what the floor is made out of. So I immediately knew it was associated with the fort and very out of place for that location. And there happened to be a very clear spot on it. And we went down and kind of hand fanned and we could feel that there was writing there was some kind of engraving in the stone. And so we knew at that point, we definitely had a, a gravestone and that we had a story. We had someone's name attached to it. And so we were able to return the next day on scuba and uh, actually clear off the gravestone and, and read who it was. And we had a very distinct name and a date. It was John Greer. And it was uh, 1861 was the year that he had passed, but we had no other information. And so we ended up at that point coming back to the archives. We have a a joke in archaeology that every day in the field is at least three or four in the office. 
And that was definitely the case with this one, because we really didn't want to necessarily come to the public before we figured out who this guy was. Why was he buried here? Why was there such an effort to to erect the monument for him? Um, and we were able to figure it out. Uh, it took us a, a fair amount of time uh, because he wasn't in the military ledger of people buried there. He was missing. And the way we were able to find out who he was was actually going through some of the most mundane archival material you can think of, uh, the ledgers, who was getting paid for what. And so we were able to determine that he was a laborer that was working at the fort between 1858 and 1861. We found his name. We found out that he was working, particularly he was a carpenter that worked on scaffolding, building scaffolding, which makes sense given you know all the masonry work that was going on in constructing Fort Jefferson. And we figured out that it was we we. Definitely knew it was him because he never picked up his last paycheck. The November oh. entry for this individual, he had a half a paycheck waiting for someone to pick up. And that was how we knew that this individual by this name was working at this spot. And most likely he never left. Does it say how much the paycheck was? <laughs> I believe it was $7 and 80 cent. Any idea where he was from? Not yet. That's been a, a big question for us now is now, you know, we're taking this information. We figured out that he was a civilian working at the fort and we have tried to follow up via like ancestry.com. Honestly, some of the press, you know, attention that we're getting, we're hoping, Hey, maybe somebody was related to someone who has a story about a, a uncle or a great grandfather or whatever down in the, the Florida Keys who passed away somehow during the civil war. We're hoping that maybe somebody will come out and reach out to us. Uh, but so far that hasn't happened yet. Now, what is interesting is we have a second grave that was found just last week. Uh, we were actually giving a tour to uh, uh, some dignitaries from the Seminole Tribe of Florida who were interested in the site. And we're visiting the Dry Tortugas um, to follow up on several other projects going on out there. And we took them over to the site and we we're discussing some of the implications of the, the potentially having a submerged graveyard. And we were basically just swimming around and we happened to find a second grave. And that individual is uh, his name is Jasper L. Belding, and his gravestone is much more ornate. It's got a motif of a Bible on the front of it, and actually has his full name. Died April twenty first, eighteen sixty seven, aged thirty nine years. And on the very bottom, it says erected by, and it's very faint. We have to go down and do either an etching or some kind of pressing to where we can figure out what it actually says. But that's another individual. And so, what our hope is is again, we're going back and we're doing background research on him. He was another uh, civilian. Uh, they just have him marked as citizen in the burial logs. Um, but our hope is that we can go and track that guy down and maybe some of his family. And we actually do have a potential hit on uh, something like Ancestry or, or something like that. So we, we may potentially have uh, some descendants. That leads us to what's happening in the future for this site. From an archaeological perspective, we've we've documented it. We know that it's there. We know the basic extents, uh, and we're we're monitoring and protecting it as an archaeological resource, just like we would any other shipwreck site or terrestrial archaeological resource. But the level of documentation that we have right now, we need to do more. We need to get back out there. And we need to get in the water um, to really get a a good baseline understanding of this site and pretty much go through it with archaeologists underwater, almost shoulder to shoulder making sure that we don't miss anything um, and to go back through and really make sure that we understand what's there because it's going to be important not only for telling uh, additional stories that we may come up with, but it's also going to matter in terms of long-term monitoring for this site, understanding how the changing environment is impacting it, uh, determining whether increased storm activity is causing erosion at this particular site and if it's threatening the archaeological resources there. Well, I want to go back to the size of John Greer's headstone and, of course, the new discovery with Jasper. But it seems to me his headstone was quite big. I think you said five feet by two feet. Mm -hmm. Is that what you said? Okay. And that seems like a pretty large headstone. And I guess compared to the, the newest discovery, are they about the same? John Greer's headstone is larger, and it's very large uh, compared to the second one. The second one is more typical, I guess, what you would think of in terms of a small headstone. But uh, Greer's is particularly interesting because, like I said, it, it's almost my size. I, I remember swimming down and holding on to it and, and basically having it cover my entire body. Because it's made out of a piece of gray wacky, which is, again, the type of sandstone that they used on the floor of the fort, we knew that it was 
basically salvaged material from the fort that somebody working on the fort at the time literally said, hey, this is appropriate for uh, constructing a headstone and, and wanted to put it out. What's interesting is the gray, gray wacky that's within the fort are very p- particular cut sizes in terms of the tile. And there's only one piece in each of the casemates that would actually fit. And it's the very top where the gun pivots on the floor. There's one piece that measures, I think it's six feet by two. So it's the only piece that they could have took and actually cut down to that size. So it's almost as if they went and they actually got, you know, of the stock that they had, they had that particular size that was available and appropriate. So that's what they wanted to use. So it's, it's kind of neat that in theory, we've been able to take the headstone that's out there and look at the fort and say, we're pretty sure that this is where this particular material came from and actually be able to stand on a point on the floor and point at, you know, this is where this particular type of stone came from. Wow. And it also is interesting to me that there wasn't that much sand on top of this headstone, right? Uh, Because you were able to see the edges of it, at least. How much sand and silt did you have to brush off to, to read what it said? Almost none. Honestly, there was a little bit of marine growth, small you know, green vegetation, but there really wasn't that much. It was really just sitting on the surface, which is kind of amazing when you think of you know how long it's been there and nobody's known that it's there. The area is prone to bad currents, and I think that kind of keeps the sediment kind of sheared off a little bit. But um, yeah, it wasn't well buried. It was just beneath the surface. And what about the hospital? How big was that? Can you see the whole foundation under the water? The the foundation, it measures approximately 30 feet square. Um, and it's unique in that it was built, the one in the 1890s was built as a, quote, hurricane-proof building. Now, we, we all know that's a fallacy you know, even today. But the, the reason it was called hurricane-proof was because it had concrete foundations. And that was the, the, the new thing out there. Whereas before, they would just have pilings in the ground or, or something along those lines. These were specifically built with concrete foundation pilings, and that was unique to this particular structure. And that's what we found. So it almost looks like giant pilings that are coming up out of the, uh, the, the surface of the sand. And they're very, very regular intervals. They're spaced out at about 10 foot apart, and they form a giant square with a smaller square open in the middle. 30 by 30 is not very big. Uh, how many floors does anybody think it, it, it was? It was described as a, a very simple structure. It was pretty much a single floor that it was split into fours for individual rooms. So it, it was a very small, simple structure. So do you think the floors were wooden and have probably just dissolved over time? Yeah. So the, the vast majority of this, what we would call superstructure, you know, in terms of what's above the foundations, it was all wood. And, and wood honestly doesn't preserve particularly well in the dry tortugas unless it's pretty quickly buried. Now, that said, there's always archaeological evidence uh, surrounding a structure. You know, you think of buttons and coins and stuff that fall through the floor cracks. You think of the nails that held it together. Any kind of metal is probably still pretty close by. And then you also think archae- most archaeologists, they really study trash. You know, it's, it's what people have left behind, maybe purposely deposited. And so wh- whoever was living out there and working out there, they would often deposit things probably, honestly, in the ocean immediately adjacent, just off island. But there's uh, th- we have found some light scatterings of ceramics and stuff like that in the area that indicates that there is a, there was a settlement there at one point. So the other hospital structures that have also, you know, disappeared over the years, um, do you know if these might be the same size? What do you know about them? We don't know nearly as much about some of the other structures that were utilized as hospitals uh, on the islands off away from Fort Jefferson. Um, we do have archaeological remains of one other that we've known about for, for a very long time, probably from the 1970s. And they it, that structure was built on brick foundations. So those foundations still exist, but almost nothing else does. It's uh, that particular island is so dynamic that it's all pretty much washed away, and there's only really a few bricks left. Most of the other structures on the, uh, like I said, on the ancillary islands, we haven't been able to find evidence of. There are multiple areas where there's been hospitals within the fort, or at least immediately adjacent on the fort, on the little sand spit uh, where the camp current camp area is, and we do know a fair amount about the sizes of those structures and how they're built, but they're they're different from from this one. This one was specifically built as a pretty quick, quick and dirty quarantine hospital away from the fort. 
It was really meant to treat those patients who were infectious and potentially a threat to others living in the fort. How many times have you been out there and uh, how many times have you dived it yourself, this, this location? Um, since we have found it probably four times. Um, honestly, it's, it's difficult to plan field work out there. And so we tend to batch and I should be going out there in the next month or so, uh, possibly in the next month or two months out. Um, so we typically for the cultural resource division, we have so much stuff going on on the, on the fort itself that oftentimes we, we don't always get to go out and get on the water, but, uh, we usually plan two, one to two trips a year where we really focus on the underwater resources, get out there. Um, and then we'll also go out and do more routine monitoring as we can. Uh, so, so we get out and kind of get eyes on a lot of the other shipwreck sites within the park. Uh, we do additional survey looking for additional wrecks uh, and other resources, as well as go out and do uh, better levels of documentation on the resources that we know about already, including this one. So the next big trip out to evaluate the site of the hospital and the cemetery, how many folks will be involved in that outing? Um, usually we have pretty small crews, anything from four to eight, depending on the projects and, and what all we have going on at the fort. I think for the most, uh, the one that's coming up, we should have four. It's going to be a very small trip this year, but we usually will, we have two archaeologists at the park that routinely dive, uh, myself and one other. Uh, and then we also work with members of the National Park Services Submerged Resources Center, which yeah, I wanted to ask special, you about that. Yeah, they're a specialized group that works. Uh, they're actually headquartered in Denver, uh, Colorado, which is always odd when people think of a marine unit, but there's a story behind that. <laughs> um, but we also work with uh, members of the Southeast Archaeological Center. There's several uh, archaeologists who dive with that group. And so we kind of all come together, especially when we need some additional staffing or we need a little bit of help or some technical expertise. We'll partner with those folks uh, when we're going out and doing work in the Dry Tortugas and occasionally in Biscayne as well. Sounds like it would be an exciting project to be on. I think so. And honestly, it's, it's been probably one of the biggest projects of my career. And I know I, I'm, I don't necessarily like being in the limelight for it. I've really wanted to put like all the pictures are either actually of the, uh, the intern, Devin Fogarty, who found it originally taken by Charlie Spruill, our archaeologist at SEAC. So we're all very excited. We all are, are pretty big nerds about it, honestly. We, we're constantly digging through archives on our own time and trying to figure out additional stories that, that will maybe help us make heads or tails out of the archaeological resources that are out there. Do you think the graves would ever be dug up? No, it's not really in the, uh, the best interest for the National Park Service. Our, our mission out here is to preserve and protect for, for future resources, or, I'm sorry, for future generations. And honestly, it's not something that, that we as archaeologists really do in the Park Service. You know, these are, this is a sacred area. It's, you know, it's important for these folks. I'm a military veteran myself, so was, so was Devin. Um, we have a connection with these folks. This was their final resting place. There's no reason to, to go and, and bring these folks up. But I do think it's important to highlight their stories and document, you know, where they fell, where, you know, where they ended up ending their lives because these folks are not lost if they're never forgotten. And I think that's really the important thing here from the Park Services standpoint is we're looking to better tell some of those stories. This find is really a good example of the dynamic environment that we have at Dry Tortugas and the stories that can be told if we're able to go out and do a survey. And that's, the park has not had a dedicated archeologist until probably within the last 10 years. And they haven't had a dedicated maritime archaeologist ever until I came on board about two years ago, about a year ago now. So we, and we're just barely scratching the surface on what's out there. So I think there's a lot of potential. I think that this find highlights some of the challenges that we're facing in terms of climate change and increased storm activity, because we can't really protect what we don't know about. And so additional survey, increased survey out there is really going to go, I, I think there's a lot of potential. I think there's going to be a lot of future stories that are going to be some really cool connections that extend well beyond the confines of Fort Jefferson itself. Josh, many thanks for your time today. Um, this is really a fascinating topic, and we're interested in learning about future discoveries and learning more about the stories that you uncover. So uh, please keep us posted. We will. That's our show for this week. We hope you enjoyed it. Next week, 
we'll explore the question of whether to expand the national park system, what sites might be considered for expansion, how to get it done, and why it should be done. I think it'll be a fascinating and provocative conversation. For The Traveler, this is Kurt Repencheck. See you in the parks. The composers and musicians at Orange Tree Productions have created a unique collection known as the National Park Series that has grown to include more than 30 CD titles. Composed against the backdrop of a park's sounds of nature, these musical scores will connect you with these beautiful places and take you there, at least in your mind. This collection is the number one selling National Park audio series in the world and provides the background music for National Park's Travelers podcasts. Visit them at orangetreeproductions.com. Editing and production work for the National Parks Traveler podcast is done by Splitbeard Productions. You can learn more about us at splitbeardproductions.com. National Parks Traveler is a 501c3 nonprofit media organization that provides daily editorial coverage of national parks and protected areas. Traveler's coverage is made possible by reader and listener donations. Visit us at nationalparkstraveler.org.